Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, Senior English A, and our objective for the hour is to talk about the assignment that we know is coming next Tuesday, where we must write an Elizabethan sonnet, or sometimes referred to as a Shakespearean sonnet. Now, to, to talk about this with any kind of intelligence, we got to talk a little bit of history. The very first poems, and now you're just taking notes, the very first poems were long narrative poems that told a story. The most famous of these poems, of course, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and of course the great Roman poet Virgil's Aeneid. All three of these poems have a couple of things in common. One, they're really long poems. I mean hundreds of pages long. And two, they tell a story, which is why we call them a narrative poem. And for a long time, if you said, I'm a poet, what that meant was you wrote poems of that length and you told a story about some great adventure. Of course, a famous epic poem in the English tradition is the poem Beowulf. It's long and it tells about a story. It tells about a famous hero. At some point, let's just call it 1300, because that's easy, 1,300 years after the birth of Christ, the Italians start playing games with poetry. The first thing they do is they shorten the poems. The second thing they do is to start to play games with the form of the poems. Okay? The form of the poem, the way it looks on the page. The great inventor of the sonnet is a cat named Petrarch. Now your hymnal is, try, is trying to introduce you to this on page 326, 327. I mean, you get to look at his little painting there on 326 with the laurel leaf around his head. You can see the dates. Do you see the dates right under his picture of 1304 to 1375? I like just 1350 as your date. All right, you know you're hitting it right in the middle if you go 1350. 1350 is the year then, easy year to remember, that Petrarch starts playing the game of the sonnet. Now, what is a sonnet? A sonnet is a poem with a very special form. Okay? There are, you could say it this way, rules. And these rules really can't be broken or it's not a sonnet. The way I like to think about it, it's a game that gets played. And I've often said it this way, Miss Benitez, it's like playing the game of a Nike shoe box. You know, the shoe company Nike, right? If I were to bring in here... Nike shoe boxes of the same exact kind, all of them the same. And I were to hand out all those shoe boxes and I were to say, now we're going to play a game. We're interested to see who can fit the most stuff inside of the Nike shoe box without tearing the shoe box. And you can't go any higher than the dead top of the shoe box. Ready, set, go. Okay? And then we go out, start looking for stuff, see how much stuff we could fit. And we're going to have a competition, a game that we would play. Who can fit the most stuff inside of the shoe box? A sonnet is a Nike shoebox. It's a, it's a poetic form. The rules of the sonnet are, are kind of the same, but it's the creative competition to see who can fit the most stuff inside of the shoebox or inside of the form. Think of it this way. You're shooting hoops over at Kiwanis, and from two blocks away, you hear the music long before you see the vehicle. It's that loud. Bronk just smiles. And immediately you know something about the music. You don't know the song exactly, but you immediately know that what the uh, people inside of the vehicle are listening to is rap. Now the way you know that is because there is a certain kind of driving rhythm or beat that defines music that we know of as rap. Now people who don't know rap music will say mistakenly, it all sounds the same, which is of course ludicrous. It doesn't anywhere nearly sound the same for those of us who listen to rap. But we would say that there is something about rap that makes it rap in regards to its internal rhythms. If you don't have that, it's not that it's not music, it's just that it's not rap. Sonnet writing, very similar. There are three rules for it to be a sonnet, okay? The first and the most simple rule is number of lines. You must have 14 lines. You can't have 13, you can't have 15. Now, you can have a 13-line poem, you can have a 15-line poem, we just don't call it a sonnet. Secondly, there must be some kind of end 
rhyme. That is to say, at the end of the lines, the words will rhyme. Right? Now, you're familiar with doggerel. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. The words will rhyme at the end of those lines. That's what we mean by end rhyme. Now, but, the end rhyme is consistent in patterns, in certain patterns, okay? That's the second rule. The third rule has to do with the rhythm of the language. There has to be some kind of beat or rhythm of the language, and again, it's consistent. Now, in 1350, Petrarch's writing in Italian, which is the great language of poetry. There are so many words that rhyme in Italian. It makes it very easy, and it's a very melodic language, not unlike, of course, Spanish, maybe the most beautiful language of them all. And Spanish and Italian and French all are derived from the same root, and they all of those languages share in common very rhythmic kinds of, well, if you don't know Spanish but you hear it spoken, you can pick up immediately on the rhythms of the language. So many of you have sat in airports and listened to somebody talking French and went, man, I don't know what they're saying, but it sure does sound good. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. All right, okay, that is Petrarch. By 1600, let's use that as a working date, so you can kind of see, roughly 300 years later. By 1600, Shakespeare is living and writing, right? 1600 is the easy date for us with, with Hamlet. I mean, he produces Hamlet on the stage in 1600, okay? Now, this time period, roughly 1600, we call the English Renaissance. Renaissance, okay? Now, what is the Renaissance, okay? And what are we talking about when we're talking about the Renaissance, all right? Now, if you have already started looking on page 290, and by the way, there's the spelling of the word for you, Renaissance, right, on 290. If you've already kind of, uh, you know, started your project here with Renaissance, you know a little bit, and if you read your book. Now, I like to ask this question. Dude, what's up with the Renaissance? Watch my whiteboard. I can make this pretty simple, pretty quick for you. Remember this little project? We do this little line thingy, remember that? We put a zero there and we call it, what? The birth of Christ. And then we talk about events which kind of occur going two different directions from zero. We can talk about events which occur before the common era and events which we will call common era earlier called AD, correct? You remember all this, right? We sit out here at what? We're in what, 2013, which qualifies us in what century? 21st the 21st century. century, right? Okay, <coughs> right? Now, when we're talking Beowulf, remember, we're talking roughly 1,000 common era. About 1,000 years after the birth of Christ, we have that famous story about that hero who does all those things with Grendel and Grendel's mom and all of that, okay? Notice we've already said 1350 for Petrarch, okay? Right? 1350. Remember, 1300 is Chaucer. Right? You got me? So you can get a sense of kind of where we're at. Okay? <laughs> now we're going to go to 1600. And we're going we're gonna to reference this as the age of the Renaissance. Okay? By the way, just to give you a sense of this, Columbus sails the ocean blue and when? 1492. Right? You see this? 1492 is eight years from what year? 1500, right? You see that? Okay, so that starts to give you a sense of where we're at in terms of the timeline of world history, correct? Okay, now this period we call the Renaissance, which is often called the age of rebirth, but I like a different term for your notes, rediscovery, rediscovery, okay, rebirth, rediscovery. Now, let's imagine it for a moment. Frederick there finally decides to clean his bedroom. And he pulls his bed out from the wall and he rediscovers a CD that's fallen down behind his bed that he, that he rediscovers. Now, if he rediscovers that, what does that mean? He had it. He lost it. He found it again. Right? That's called rediscovery. As opposed to if Frederick pulls out his bed and all of a sudden he discovers a CD, that's a different project. If you rediscover something, you have it, you lose it, you find it again, correct? The Renaissance is called a rediscovery. Question, what is it that is rediscovered? What is it that they had 
then they lost, and then they refined it again. That's what we call this time period, the Renaissance. What is it that they had, then they lost, and then they rediscovered again? I don't get it. And for those of you who say art, <coughs> I will say, yeah, but here's the problem with that. We're in 1600. And if you've been to England or Europe, anywhere in Europe, you see those huge cathedrals that got built during this time? Dude, they knew art. It's, un it's pretty unbelievable. I mean, when I've taken students into those cathedrals, I, they're just stunned by how amazing they are. So clearly they were doing art. What was lost that was refound in 1600? What was rediscovered? Anybody want to take a stab at it? What's yeah, rediscovered? What? That's, that might hurt taking a stab at it. Take a stab at it anyway. <laughs> what do you think, Frank? You got any ideas for us? What's like rediscover? Their sense of enlightenment. Enlightenment meaning what? I don't know. Like, see, here's the thing. If you say enlightenment means that they were smart, dude, there were people that lived during this time that had every word of the Bible memorized. I do mean that, Nelson. Every single word. So you could say any line of the Bible, they could start quoting for you the rest of the entire Bible. In, are you ready for this? In the original languages of Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. So, I mean, if we're talking about smarts, they clearly were smart. Can you do that? <laughs> so what's going on? What, 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 is, what is it that's lost and rediscovered? How about it? Mr. Keeley, you got any ideas? With this one, I have no idea. See, and this is fascinating. We've had history classes where we filled out the worksheet on the Renaissance. Would you agree with me in our sophomore year or whenever it was? The Renaissance, right? We filled it out, and it's a funny... Uh, guys, this is a foundational is question. Culture? You don't know anything about the Renaissance if you can't answer this simple uh, question. Is it what is culture? it that they had, Michaels, and then they rediscovered? Do you have any sense of it at all? Like, what is it? They had something, and then they lost it, and then they rediscovered it. Would it be culture? But here's the problem again. Dude, for the thousand years of what we call the Dark Ages, there's unbelievable culture. All you got to do is go inside those cathedrals to see that. They're, they built cathedrals. Like I said, if you've been in one of those cathedrals, you go, oh, how? That's their first question. Every time I take students in there, they're like, how? How did they build this? Religion. They had that for a thousand years. I just kept saying churches. <clears throat> Religion. It's All right, are you ready for this? Watch my whiteboard. It's actually a pretty simple answer. Before Christ is born, right, out here roughly at, let's call it 400 BCE, you have the rise of the great Greek people. At roughly 200, you have the rise of the Romans. When we put those two terms together, we call them the Greco-Roman period, right? Remember, what is it that the Greeks will give to us? Homer, for one, right? The Romans will give us Virgil for another. These are those two poets I was referencing, right? What is it that has been lost and then rediscovered? It's that culture. It's that culture of the Greco-Romans. Okay? So, for example, when you look at Shakespeare's play Romeo and Juliet, that play is actually a play off of a, a famous story from Greek antiquity called Pyramus Thisbe, okay? It's a famous story from Greek culture. Now, it's not that these people didn't know about the Greeks and the Romans. It's that they kind of had forgotten about the texts and the stories. This thousand years we call the Dark Ages. Now, why do we call it the Dark Ages? Because there's no fluorescent lighting? They had lots of plagues. But why do they call it the Dark Ages, and who called it the Dark Ages? Watch my whiteboard. This time period is called the Dark Ages, as opposed to this time period that's called the... Well, somebody even used the word enlightenment. Right? That's, that's this time period. That's this time period, enlightenment, right? So what does it mean to call it the Dark Ages? Well, this is a thousand years, roughly, from 600 to 1600, roughly. 300 to 1300, roughly, depending on where you start counting, right? A thousand years where the church has total power. And everything about their culture is defined through the church. The Greco-Roman period, different kind of... Let me give you one story that explains this. <clears throat> I'll give you a parallel, examples. 
out of the Bible, there's a story about a chap named Job, J-O-B. It looks like his name ought to be named Job, but it's actually pronounced Job. Job, we're told in this story, is a pretty remarkable guy. He is good in every way, but he gets seriously jacked with all kinds of terrible things. First, he gets terrible illness, really bad sick, like having terrible AIDS. Then his children all die, all his kids die, and all of his money is taken away from him. He becomes a completely poor guy. He was a billionaire, and then he has nothing. His wife says to him, you should just curse God and die. Job says, no, I don't want to do that. I will continue to believe in God. Okay, at the end of the story, he gets all his stuff back. That's one story. That story is a story very popular for the thousand years of the Dark Ages. But there's another story, and it predates this story by a number of years. This is a different story about a chap named Prometheus. Prometheus discovers fire. He wants to give that fire to humans. King God Zeus says, you ain't giving it to him. Prometheus says, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> to the God, he does. And he gives fire to humans so that they can, like, what, cook their food and fly airplanes into buildings and things like that. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he says, and, and Zeus says, oh, you shouldn't have done that. I'm jacking you for that. And he takes him and he crucifies him on a rock. On a rock. And every day an eagle comes and eats out Prometheus' heart, causing him so much pain. And what does Prometheus do? Does he say to the god Zeus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry? No! He lays on there crucified all day long and he screams the F word at God saying, I would do it again. I'd do it a thousand times over. Up you, to God! Up you, to God! Now, let's point out. That's not a story, are you ready for this? That's not a story from the thousand years of the Dark Ages. That ain't no Christian story. That is a different story. That is a Greek story. By the way, the Greeks love that story. They love the fact that a human being would say to the gods, F you. They love that fact. It says hello. It says a lot about their view of humans, doesn't it? And the will of the human spirit to fight even against the gods. Right? Okay. The, the people of the Renaissance, like Shakespeare, rediscover a story like Prometheus, and they love it. They love those stories. Okay? Now, this will begin a new tension during the Renaissance between, obviously, the power of the church and the power of secular culture. This, of course, being secular culture. This is non-Christian. Guys, Christ is born zero. Right? We, we're talking 400 years before Christ is born. Ain't nothing Christian about that, right? We're predating anything Christian by at least 400 years. We're talking Prometheus. Got me? By Shakespeare's day, now 1600, English poets start playing the same game that Petrarch had already started. And they start also writing sonnets. 14-line poems with a rhyme scheme and a certain kind of rhythm. If you look on page 302-303... 302, 303 now, you will see that I have summarized much of the information from those two pages. Notice the sonnet structure. Okay, do you see it? Right there on page 303, you have different kinds of understandings of how you break up the lines of a sonnet. All right? We will be learning now about sonnet writing because we ourselves have to write a sonnet. The best way to do that is to start with an actual sonnet. So we will be looking at page 318 now. Go ahead and go there real quick. Okay, 318. All right. Shakespeare writes not just plays. Shakespeare writes these sonnets. And it becomes a contest of sorts. The great queen, maybe the greatest ruler of all time, Queen Elizabeth. She was certainly up there. The great Queen Elizabeth, she loved poets. And she loved to have them around her reciting poetry to her. And she loved the game of sonnet writing. It was kind of like a contest of sorts. All right, Shakespeare pretty much steals the show. Nobody does it any better than Shakespeare. And so when Shakespeare writes his sonnets, we call those sonnets... Shakespearean sonnets, or because he wrote them during the time of Queen Elizabeth, we call them Elizabethan sonnets, okay? 
Now, there's another poet who also is very famous for writing sonnets, and his name is Edmund Spencer. Take a look at page 311. When Spencer writes sonnets, this will not shock you, we call his sonnets a Spencerian sonnet, just because it's Spencer who wrote it. So we're going to have two different kinds of sonnets that we'll look at. Spencerian sonnets and Shakespearean sonnets, or Elizabethan sonnets, okay? What's the difference? Well, they both have 14 lines. Well, they both have some kind of end rhyme, but it varies. It's a little bit different. And they both have what we will call the use of iambic pentameter. That's the rhythm part. Iambic pentameter, okay? Now, when we come back tomorrow, because we're about out of time now, when we come back tomorrow, I'm going to maybe give a little quiz. I'm giving you the questions in advance. You may want to write them down. Here are the quiz questions. One, how many lines is in a sonnet? Two, what kind of end rhyme is a Shakespearean sonnet? I'll give you a hint. When you look at this, pay attention to page 317. Three, what is iambic pentameter? Okay, now that third question may decide, may, you may have to do a little bit of research on that one. Are you saying the numbers or what? Uh, that's a good question. By numbers, do you mean 14 lines? No, like the... Iambic pentameter? Yeah, like the one. That's my question. What is iambic pentameter? I'll let you be able to tell me tomorrow. What is iambic pentameter? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with rhythms. What was the second okay. one? The second one was, what kind of rhyme scheme? rhyme scheme is a Shakespearean sonnet. So for example, when I say that it's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, what does that mean? Like what are, what are we even talking about? See, so what are we talking about? Frederick's ready to give the lecture tomorrow, he said. You better believe it. Okay, believing. Questions, comments?